in a previous section, we talked about Lewis structures. And Lewis structures draw molecules on a piece of paper in two-dimensional space. But in real life, molecules exist in three-dimensional space. So in this section, we're going to look at how molecules exist in three-dimensional space. After that, we're then going to look at whether molecules are polar or nonpolar. And believe it or not, the two have something to do with each other, so we need to um, uh, discuss that. At the, basically, the plan for this section is to go through the lecture notes. And then at the end, we'll go through several examples where we draw Lewis structures, and then we determine the um, shape of the molecules. And we also look at whether they're polar or nonpolar. Now, what's important to remember about the three-dimensional shapes of molecules is you need the Lewis structure. You cannot look at the molecular formula and guess the shape. Now, of course, if you already know the Lewis structure, you can do that. But if you don't know the Lewis structure, you need to first draw the Lewis structure and then determine the shape of the molecule. So let's look at how we do this. And the first thing that we need to learn is this concept of VSEPR which means valence shell electron pair repulsion. And this complicated uh, acronym is really um, a straightforward thing. What it means is electrons are negatively charged, so they want to be as far apart as possible. And what we're going to look at is the geometries that form when you put electron groups as far as, part as possible. So if we look here and we have two atoms, around a central point. So this is two atoms bonded to a single central atom. The furthest apart those electrons could be is 180 degrees from each other. If you put three atoms around a central point, the farthest they could be apart from each other is 120 degrees, because now you have three atoms around a central point. If you put four atoms around a central point, they form this tetrahedral geometry, which is 109.5 degrees around them. If you put five atoms around a central point, some of them will be 90 degrees in the so-called axial plane, the up and down plane, and some of them will be 120 degrees in the so-called equatorial plane. And then finally, if you put six atoms around a central point, which is the biggest uh, thing that we're going to see, is then basically um, you're, they're all going to be 90 degrees from each other. So they're 90 degrees in this direction, and they're 90 degrees in this direction. So this is how electrons spread around a central point, such that they're as, off, uh, excuse me, as far apart as possible. Again, valence shell electron peril repulsion. Because they repel each other, they want to be as far apart as possible. However, in these examples that we just shown, which we are going to use absolutely, we don't consider the presence of a lone pair. And it turns out that a lone pair takes up space, it actually takes up slightly more space than a bonding pair. So if you had two atoms around a central point and a lone pair, it would look a lot more like this than like this. So this has two atoms around a central point. If you have two atoms and a lone pair, it looks more like this than like this. And that's what we're going to look at in the next table. And what I'm going to show you is how to use a table to figure out how these things are going to be um, arranged in three-dimensional space. You don't have to do the geometry here to figure out what's the best uh, way to, for them to be, you know, 109.5 degrees apart. Instead, you have to use a table to figure out how many degrees apart they will be, essentially, um, based on the table. Now, what we're going to use is names for these different things. So each of these arrangements have names. So in this case, if they're like this, we call that linear. If they're like this, we call it trigonal planar. Like this is tetrahedral, as I mentioned. This is trigonal bipyramidal, and this is called octahedral. And we're not going to use this particular table, but this gives us a nice, this nice spatial arrangement picture, so you can see it in three-dimensional space far better than I could draw it, and far better than it is on the next slide. But on the next slide, what we're going to look at is these things in um, in this slide, where what we're looking at is the different arrangements of the atoms. And you'll notice that this is a table. 
here it, on one side of the table, we have number of electron pairs. So I would cross this out and call this domains. And here you have number of lone pairs. Zero lone pair, one lone pair, two lone pair, three lone pair, four lone pair. So domains, two, three, four, five, six, lone pairs, one, two, three, four. And you read this just like a table. So you have to count for each atom the number of domains and the number of those domains that are lone pairs. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking at least about a, a, the first few of these um, groups. I probably won't talk about every single one of them, but some of them. So to do that, I'd like to switch over to this so I can cross some of them out. So if we have a central atom and that central atom has two atoms around it and no lone pairs, then it, these atoms want to be 180 degrees apart. So this is called a linear geometry. Now, if one of these x's was a lone pair, it wouldn't exist. Because if one of these is a lone pair, you no longer have a central atom. So in order to have a central atom, you need to have at least three atoms in a row. And if one of these is a lone pair, there is no central atom. So here, there's no entry. Let's look at the next one. If you have three atoms around a central point, like so, they're going to be 120 degrees apart. This is as far apart as they possibly can be. And they're going to be in one plane, the plane of the paper. This is called trigonal planar. Trigonal because it's three of them, like a triangle, and planar because it's all in one plane. So this is the trigonal planar geometry. Note that this is three domains, three atoms, and no lone pairs. What counts as a domain is atoms and lone pairs. So domains, as it says on the previous slide, are atoms and lone pairs. And we'll start to look at actual examples shortly. Now, what happens if one of these three domains is one of these lone pairs? Well, now we go over on the table to one lone pair. And on the table, we call this bent or angular. And you'll notice that one of these three domains is a lone pair. The other two are atoms. You'll also notice that this compresses the bond angle. Here, the XEX -E -X bond angle is 120 degrees. Here, the XEX, -E -X, where X and E just mean any atoms, is less than 120 degrees. This is because two ways you can think about this. A lone pair takes up more space. And the reason that a lone pair takes up more space, or the other way of thinking about it is, that the lone pair is on average closer to this nucleus. So therefore, it compresses this bond angle and it's less than 120 degrees. I should note that it's 120 degrees if these are all X. If one of these is an oxygen and two of them are hydrogen, like in formaldehyde, the oxygen is bigger and that will also compress the bond angle. So this is called bent or angular. So if one of the three domains is a lone pair, it's a lot more like trigonal planar, it's around 120 degrees, and a lot light, less like linear, even though in this case there are two X's attached to a single central point two x's attached to a single central point. The lone pair also takes up space, and you end up with this bent or angular situation. Let's look at the next one. In this case, we have four things around the central atom, and this is called tetrahedral, and the bond angle is 109.5 degrees. They didn't put the 0.5. So the XEX -E bond angle is 109.5. This XEX -E is the same, and this XEX -E is the same. Again, this assumes that X is all the same atom, such as in, for example, CH4 methane. So you end up with this tetrahedral arrangement. Well, what if one of these X's is a lone pair? Well, if we have one lone pair, so we go one over on the table, then this lone pair takes up more space, or is closer to the nucleus on average, closer to this nucleus on average, and this compresses the XEX -E -X bond angle to less than 109.5. The geometry is called trigonal pyramidal. 
again, this E has three things around it and a lone pair. But it's much more like the tetrahedral geometry than it is like the trigonal planar geometry. The bond angle is close to 109.5. It is not close to 120 because that lone pair takes up space. In this case, you can actually have two lone pairs as well. And this is called um, bent, usually bent. Um, and this has a much less than 109.5 degree bond angle. And here you have two lone pairs, each of which is taking up a little bit more space, which is further compressing this 109.5 degree bond angle. Let's look at a couple examples with expanded octets. Here we have an expanded octet where we have um, five domains around a central atom. And three of them are in one plane called the axial plane and have a 120 degree angle. Two of them, these, this x and this x, are in what is called the equatorial plane, and this x, e, x bond angle is 90 degrees, and this x, e, x bond angle is 180 degrees. So this is called a trigonal bipyramid, or trigonal bipyramidal. If we look at what happens if one of those are lone pairs, well, the lone pair um, has two choices. It could either go here or here. If it goes here, it's 90 degrees from one, two, three x's. If it goes here, it's only 90 degrees from two x's. So this lone pair chooses to go here. And you don't need to memorize this, but that's why the lone pair is in the axial plane. Remember, the 120 degree plane is the axial, and the 90 degree plane, this 90 degrees, is um, the equatorial, or this x, e, x being 180. That's the equatorial plane. So here, this chooses to go in the axial plane. And this is usually called seesaw. It can be called sawhorse as well, but I usually call it seesaw. What if two of them are lone pairs? Well, if two of them are lone pairs, they both go in the axial plane, and you end up with this T-shaped thing. So again, lone pairs take up space just like bonding pairs. And then that one doesn't... Uh, excuse me, this does come up, with three lone pairs, they all go in the axial plane, and the x, e, x bond angle is 180 degrees. What if you have four domains, another expanded, or excuse me, six domains, which is another expanded octet? In this case, they're all 90 degrees. x, e, x here is 90 degrees, x, e, x here is 90 degrees, x, e, x here is 90 degrees, they're all 90 degrees. This is called octahedral. Again, this assumes that x's are all the same. In this case, you have six things around the central atom, six domains. What if one of them is a lone pair? Well, in this case, it doesn't really matter where you put one lone pair because they're all 90 degrees from each other. And we call this a square, square pyramid or square pyramidal. If two of them are lone pairs, you want them in the equatorial plane. And the reason for that is you want them opposite of each other. So at least the lone pairs, which take up space, are 180 degrees apart. This compresses this. Um, this does not compress this 90 degree bond angle because it's being pushed on from this side and being pushed on from this side. When there's one, it compresses the bond angle. When there's two, it doesn't. And that's the last one that actually comes up. So these are the different um, domains or excuse me, the different uh, VSEPR geometries. Note that domains are counted as atoms and lone pairs. And once you draw the Lewis structure, if you want to find out which one your thing is, you're going to use this table, and the first thing you're going to do is count the domains. Again, at the end, we'll do several examples where we do exactly that. So let's look at these two different terms. The first term is the electron geometry. And the electron geometry is based only on domains, whether they're lone pairs or whether they're um, atoms that just counts the number of domains. Said another way, if you look at the table that we just showed, the electron geometry always comes out of the first column. So this is where the electron geometry always comes out of. Now, if we, we have this other thing called the molecular geometry. 
The molecular geometry, abbreviated MG, I should have mentioned the electron geometry is abbreviated EG, includes lone pair domains if the atom has them. So let's take a look at how we count domains in an atom and how we use this table. So first, what we have here is carbon dioxide. So I've drawn the Lewis structure. So if it were given on a test, CO2, the first thing I would do is draw the Lewis structure. Now I want to count the domains. Atoms are domains and lone pairs are domains. I'm counting them with respect to the central atom. I'm not counting all that are present. I'm just counting with, just with respect to the central atom carbon. Carbon has one, two domains, two atoms. It does not matter that it's a double bond. A double bond does not count as two domains because the atom takes up space, not the double bond. We'll talk more about double bonds in the next chapter. So in this case, we have two domains. Zero of the two domains are lone pairs. So if I want the electron geometry, I consider the domains only. So I go to two domains, which is linear. So the electron geometry here is linear. Since none of these domains are lone pairs, zero of the two domains are lone pairs with respect to carbon, the molecular geometry is the same. Whenever you have no lone pairs on the central atom, the molecular and the electron geometry are the same. So this is electron geometry linear, molecular geometry of linear. Let's look at water. Again, on a test, you might be given H2O and then ask these things. So water has four domains. One, two, three, four. Two atoms and two lone pairs. Again, domains are atoms and lone pairs. So water has one, two, three, four domains. Two of the four domains are lone pairs. So if we go to the table, the electron geometry is based on the total number of domains, four. The electron geometry always comes out of the first column, so it's tetrahedral. Now, if I want the molecular geometry, I need to realize that two of those four domains are lone pairs. So I count over one lone pair, two lone pairs. The molecular geometry for water is bent. Again, it has four domains, so it's tetrahedral electron geometry. Two of those four domains are lone pairs, so I go to the two lone pairs, I look down, so four, two, and I find that it's bent. So this is basically what we're doing. Let's look at this example. I want to count the domains with respect to carbon. One, two, three domains. Note that the double bond still counts as one domain because it's atoms and lone pairs that count as domains. And I'm only counting them with respect to the central atom. One, two, three. Three domains, zero of which are lone pairs. Since there's no lone pairs on the central atom, I know the electron geometry and the molecular geometry are going to be the same. Using my table, I go to three domains, no lone pairs, and it's trigonal planar. Since there are no lone pairs with the central atom, both the electron geometry and the molecular geometry are trigonal planar. So that's how um, we have determined this. The next thing we want to talk about here is the difference between uh, the polarity of bonds and the polarity of molecules. And we already talked about the polarity of bonds. If you remember, electronegativity is how much atoms like to share or how much atoms like electron density. And in covalent bonds between two or more nonmetals, the electron density is not necessarily shared equally. So fluorine, a very electronegative atom, is going to take more of the, electron, more of the electron density than any other, of the other atoms. And generally speaking, the more electronegative atom is going to um, have the electron density more on it, and it's going to be partially negative. And the less electronegative atom is going to have less electron density on it, and it's going to be partially positive. And we talked about this before in the previous section. So if we're looking at nonpolar covalent bonds, it's two of the same atom bonded, oxygen and oxygen, or nitrogen and nitrogen, or anything else, because the two atoms have the exact same electronegativity. Another example of a nonpolar covalent bond is the carbon-hydrogen bond, because it has a very small difference in electronegativity. So if you look at C2H6, it has a carbon-carbon bond and a bunch of carbon-hydrogen bonds, and this is nonpolar because there's not a great difference in electronegativity. So these are your nonpolar covalent bonds.
all other polar uh, covalent bonds within reason are polar. There are occasional cases where the difference in electronegativity is very small. We're not going to consider those cases here. So two different atoms with a covalent bond, nonmetals, like in water. So the hydrogen-oxygen bond, oxygen is partially negative and hydrogen is partially positive. If this isn't enough of a review for the polarity of bonds, I suggest going back to the previous section, uh, a few sections ago, where we covered the polarity of bonds. So this is covalent bonds only between two or more nonmetals. This does not apply to ionic compounds. But this is the polarity of bonds. And this is not the same, which is why I'm spending a few minutes to review it, as the polarity of molecules. When it comes to the polarity of molecules, there's a different thing going on. So let's look at this of these few examples. So if you remember, this means this end is positive and this end is negative. So here we have carbon dioxide. The carbon oxygen bond is certainly polar. Why? Because there's a difference in electronegativity between carbon and oxygen. Oxygen is closer to fluorine and is more electronegative than carbon, so it's going to pull the electron density away from carbon. But in the case of carbon dioxide, you have one oxygen pulling electron density uh, to the left and another oxygen pulling electron density to the right. And at the end of the day, nobody can win. It's like if you put two equally uh, powered uh, cars and tied them together and one drives this way and one drives this way and the drivers are equally skilled, they're not going to go anywhere because one's pulling in this direction and one's pulling with equal force in the opposite direction. And if you've taken physics, this is called vector addition. So basically we have a vector going in this direction and a vector going in this direction. These are not written as vectors, but you can think of them that way. So the, the net idea here is that even though these individual bonds should be polar, the overall molecule is nonpolar. Let's look at another example, BF3. BF3 is an interesting example because it doesn't have an octet. Boron is something that is an exception to the octet rule uh, because it's a very small atom. It doesn't actually have an octet. So here we have this one pulling in this direction, this one pulling in this direction, and this one pulling in this direction. Even if you can't see that the vectors will cancel out and the electrons will go nowhere, they will. In this case, they will all cancel out. And here we have a uh, tetrahedral case. This is a trigonal planar case. Here we have a tetrahedral case where these aren't even all in the same plane. I didn't draw it that way, but they're not. And when you look at this, these all cancel each other out as well. So the question becomes, well, what do these three examples have in common? And what these three examples have in common is all of the domains are the same. If all of the domains are the same around a central atom, the molecule will be nonpolar, even if the individual bond is polar. Fluorine is certainly capable of pulling electron density away from carbon, but it's not pulling against carbon. It's pulling against three other fluorines, and that's why it cancels out. So if all of the domains are the same, the molecule is nonpolar. Remember that domains are uh, atoms and lone pairs. So if all the atoms are the same, then it's going to be nonpolar. Note that if it has lone pairs, they're not all going to be the same because it's not going to have all lone pairs, right? If it has all lone pairs, it's not a molecule, it's just an atom. Let's look at polar molecules. If the domains are not all the same, the molecule is polar. And we have two examples of this. In this case, we have three fluorines and a bromine. Well, fluorine is going to be more effective at pulling electron density than bromine. To illustrate that, I made the lines longer for fluorine and a little shorter for bromine. I don't know if that's a technically correct way to do it, but I'm just trying to illustrate a point. So when we look here, we notice that we have three fluorines and a bromine. Not all the domains are the same. This is a polar molecule. What about in this case? In the case of water, we have two lone pair domains and two hydrogen domains. Oxygen pulls electron density away from hydrogen. It's not equal in opposite directions because not all the domains are the same, so this one is polar. So there's two essentially ways that the domains cannot be all the same. Okay, And those are you have different atoms or you have lone pairs. So those are the two ways, and that makes polar molecules. 
it's important to note, if you have hydrocarbons, molecules that just contain carbon and hydrogen, they're nonpolar, but for a different reason. This is not because all domains are the same. It's because there's a very small electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen. Finally, there are two exceptions to this rule. If we look at XEF2 and XEF4, which are remarkable because they're noble gas compounds, and fluorine is incredibly reactive, and xenon is the most reactive noble gas, so someone got the good idea that what if we mix them together? And it turns out if you mix them together, they will react. And they formed these two noble gas compounds, which were, I don't remember which one came first, but these two were the first two um, noble gas compounds. That's not the point here, though. The point here is two of the domains with respect to xenon are fluorine, and three of them are lone pairs. This is so-called 5-3 linear. Why is it 5-3 linear? Five domains, one, two, three, four, five, three of which are lone pairs, one, two, three. That's a good way to memorize the table. And it's linear and it's nonpolar because just by coincidence, this fluorine and this fluorine are directly opposite of each other. Even though all domains are not the same, by coincidence, they're directly op opposite of each other. So this is overall nonpolar. In this case, we have another xenon compound, XEF4. Again, not all the domains are the same. We have four fluorine domains and two lone pair domains. This is so-called 6-2 square planar. Six, because it has six domains, the two lone pairs and the four fluorines. Two, because it has two lone pairs. In this case, this fluorine and this fluorine cancel each other out. This fluorine and this fluorine cancel each other out. And this is overall nonpolar. So 6-3 linear and 6-2 square planar are nonpolar if all the outside atoms are the same. Note, I don't think it exists, but if this were a, a fluorine and this were a chlorine, um, then it would be polar. Again, I don't think that that actually exists, although it could be an example uh, used you know, in Alex or something. So these are the two exceptions um, for nonpolar. There may be others for uh, very large numbers of domains and lone pairs, but for relatively small atoms like we're going, or relatively small molecules like we're going to use in this course, these are the only two exceptions. In fact, we don't actually use all of the uh, examples that are on the Vesper table because there's like 6.3 and 6.4, um, and those examples don't really come up in the um, molecules that we are using here. So this has been a section on shape and polarity. Shape and polarity are absolutely essential. Since these are so, this is such an important topic, what I want to do is go over a bunch of examples, uh, I think I have seven of them, prepared where we um, actually figure these things out. So we want to figure out three things. We want to figure out the um, electron geometry, the molecular geometry, and the polarity of a series of molecules. And the first one I want to do is BH3. So the very first thing that you need to do when you um, are doing this is draw the Lewis structure. Now, I'm not going to spend time talking about counting the valence electrons, least electronegative atom in the middle, fill the octets, and uh, minimize the formal charges, because there's a whole one hour video where we spend a lot of time on that um, a few sections back. But what I want to do is go directly to the Lewis structure. But what I want to point out is there's no magical way to do this. You can't look at the molecule BH3 and find the electron geometry, the molecular geometry, and the uh, polarity without drawing the Lewis structure. So step one, draw the Lewis structure. So I'm just going to directly draw them for us. So we have BH3. This is the Lewis structure of BH3. Note that the boron is an exception which doesn't want an octet, and that's because it's a very small molecule, um, and it just doesn't have enough electrons to fill its octet. So this is BH3. I want to find the electron geometry, the molecular geometry, and the polarity. And the polarity means polar or nonpolar. So these are the three things that we covered in this section that I want to find. I'm going to have to use this table in order to do this. So this is what I'm going to do here. 
So the first thing I want to do is count the domains. Well, what counts as a do domain? Atoms and lone pairs. So in this case, I have one, two, three domains. So there's three domains. The electron geometry always comes out of the first column. So the elect electron geometry here is trigonal planar. Since none of these domains are lone pairs, the molecular geometry is also trigonal planar. So the molecular geometry and the electron geometry are the same when there's no lone pairs on the central atom. Polarity. What I'm looking for is, are all domains the same? Yes, all domains are hydrogen. If all the domains are the same, it's equal in opposite directions, and you end up with a nonpolar situation. Let's look at another example. Let's look at NH3. First, draw the Lewis structure, which again, I'm going to do directly. And then we want the EG, the MG, and the polarity, just like before. Well, in this case, can't fit it all on the screen. I guess that's the best I can do. Um, in this case, we want to count the domains. Well, we have one, two, three, four domains. Atoms and lone pairs count as domains. So I have four domains. Four domains, again, the electron geometry always comes out of the first column. The electron geometry is tetrahedral. In this case, the molecular geometry is not the same, though, because one of those four domains is a lone pair. So you might call this as 4, 1 as a way to memorize it. 4, 1 is trigonal pyramid, or a lot of times it's called pyramidal. So we go to four domains, one lone pair, four domains, one lone pair. We find trigonal pyramidal. Polarity, are all the domains the same? No. One of them is a lone pair. Three of them are hydrogen. They're not all the same. This is polar. The reason I chose these two examples is if you just look at BH3 and NH3, you would think they would be the same. They should have the same molecular geometry, the same electron geometry, and the same polarity because it's an atom bonded to three H's. They're not the same. The only way you can figure these things out is with the Lewis structure. It is absolutely essential that you draw the Lewis structure in order to determine these things. Let's look at another example. Let's look at CH3F. Draw the Lewis structure. It's a C bonded to three H's and an F. I shouldn't have put the F on top, but the F has three lone pairs around it. So this is this is a third lone pair on the top. Let me just do, draw that over. So it's a C bonded to three H's and an F, and the F has three lone pairs. And we want to know the EG, the MG, molecular geometry, and the polarity of this one. So when we look for the electron geometry, we want to count the domains. So we count one, two, three, four domains. Remember, we're counting with respect to carbon. We do not count the lone pairs on fluorine as domains for carbon because those lone pairs are on fluorine. They're not on carbon. So one, two, three, four. Atoms and lone pairs count as domains. Four domains means the electron geometry is tetrahedral. Since none of the domains with respect to carbon are lone pairs, the molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. If there's no lone pairs on the central atom, then the electron geometry and the molecular geometry are the same. The next thing we have is the polarity. Well, in this case, one domain is fluorine and three domains are hydrogen. They're not all the same. This is polar. Let's look at another example. CH2O. This is formaldehyde. So C double bond O, bond H, bond H. And there are lone pairs on, hydrogen, on oxygen like that. We want to know the electron geometry, the molecular geometry, and the polarity. So for the electron geometry, we count the domains. 
we have one, two, three domains. Note, we have a double bond here. But even though we have a double bond, the atom counts as a domain, not the bonds. So this is three domains, one, two, three domains. The electron geometry of something with three domains is trigonal planar. Since none of these three domains are lone pairs with respect to carbon, then the molecular geometry is also trigonal. That's an A. Trigonal planar. Oops. Finally, the polarity. One of the domains is oxygen. Two of the domains are hydrogen. They're not all the same. This one is polar. So that's basically how we do these things. Let's look at a couple more examples. In this case, I want to look at SO2 and CO2. And I want to find the electron geometry, the molecular geometry, and the polarity for both. And again, you might think that they're both the same because it's a one atom bonded to two oxygen. But you can't do it that way. You have to first draw the Lewis structure, which again is explained a lot in a previous section. So we take S, we put a lone pairs on it, and oxygen like this. So I'm just directly drawing the Lewis structure. This is the Lewis structure of SO2. This is the Lewis structure of CO2. They're not the same. How many domains do we have with respect to sulfur? One, two, three domains. One, two, three domains. The electron geometry is going to be trigonal planar. Again, atoms and lone pairs count as domains. It doesn't matter if it's a double bond. There's two oxygens and a lone pair. That's three domains, trigonal planar. The molecular geometry, well, this is three domains, one lone pair. Three domains, one lone pair. And this could be either called bent or angular. I think the more modern uh, word is angular, but it doesn't really matter. Then finally, polarity. Are all three domains the same? No. Two of these domains are oxygen, and one of these domains are the, is a lone pair. So they're not all the same. This is polar. In the case of CO2, which again looks very similar to SO2, we get different answers in all cases. So in this case, we have two domains. This is linear electron geometry. Both of those domains are um, oxygen. Excuse me. Yeah, both of those domains are oxygen, so neither one of them is a lone pair. So there's no lone pairs, so it's linear molecular geometry. And the polarity is nonpolar because both domains are the same. So every answer here is different, even though they look very similar. You have to draw the Lewis structure. The last one that I want to look at is XEF2. And then I want to show you one other thing, and then this will be done. So in XEF2, we have three lone pairs on xenon. I need an E there. And two fluorines. And we want the molecular geometry, the electron geometry, and the polarity. And I'm just writing them a little higher, like this. So this has one, two, three, four, five domains. Um, I don't know why I wrote these backwards. So this should be the electron geometry, the molecular geometry, and the polarity. So five domains, the electron geometry is trigonal bipyramidal. Again, a lot of times they end up in that AL. The molecular geometry, well, of these five domains, threes are, three are lone pairs. So we go over to three lone pairs, five domains, three lone pairs, and we find that it's linear. What about the polarity? Not all domains are the same, but we have to remember this is five, three linear. Five domains, three lone pairs. And in this case, since these are both fluorines, this is non polar just by coincidence. One last thing that I briefly want to show you. A lot of times you'll see water, for example, 
written like this. And you might be tempted to say that water is a linear molecule, which of course is not correct. So you need to count the domains, one, two, three, four, four domains, two lone pairs, water is a bent molecule. Water is not a linear molecule. So it's very important to remember that you're always going to write um, Lewis structures in two-dimensional space because paper is two-dimensional. However, they have these three-dimensional shapes. You must use the chart until you have it memorized or you're familiar enough with it. Use the chart to find, the, um, to find these geometries because it's very important. Looking at how they're written on paper can be confusing. So that has been shapes and polarity of molecules, and that uh, concludes chapter 7. In chapter 8, we'll look at some more advanced bonding theories, um, and we'll get right to that next.